There is a reason why the world's biggest coral reefs are located in warm tropical waters. And it has to do with all that sunlight. When you look at a coral, it's actually an animal. A lot of people might think it's a plant, but it's an animal with um, a tiny plant or an algae living inside its tissue. The more sunlight there is, the more food for the coral. The algae are the building blocks or the powerhouse of the coral, so it photosynthesizes and produces energy for the animal to live, to live and grow. Coral and algae, plant and animal, live happily together until the water gets too warm. When we get elevated temperatures, it stresses the coral and it actually expels those algae out of its tissue. This is what's known as coral bleaching. As we release more carbon dioxide, climate change brings about rising temperatures and ultimately more coral bleaching. And few reefs have been hit as hard as Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Since 2016, half the coral of the Great Barrier Reef has died. And that's bad for biodiversity. It's like the rainforest of the ocean. You know, the, the corals themselves provide a lot of structure. So if you're a little fish, there's a lot of big fish out there that can potentially eat you. You need that structure to be able to hide in. When we get a lot of disturbances that kill the corals, what we see is a huge drop in the diversity of fish, but also a drop in the abundance of fish. Colourless coral, reefs left in ruin, an entire ecosystem left to die. It might seem hopeless. But here at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, researchers are conducting experiments that could change the course for coral. So you can manage water quality, you can manage fishing, you can manage um, crown of thorns, predation to a certain extent, um, but it's very hard to control the water temperature. So one of the things that I'm doing here is looking at a different type of restoration method called assisted gene flow. We're using methods of selective breeding by mixing eggs and sperm from different reefs across the Great Barrier Reef. Assisted gene flow is kind of like being a matchmaker for coral. The whole building blocks of life depend on what the genetic instructions are in the animal and those are essentially contained within the genes. This is a concept called genetic inheritance. It's the same for us, but we're not talking about the kinds of genes you wear. We're talking about the kind you're born with. You might have your father's eyes and your mother's hair, and it comes from your unique combination of their genes. But what does this have to do with coral bleaching? The Great Barrier Reef is actually the size of Italy. So the temperature range can actually vary quite a bit. So Lord Howe Island can reach temperatures in the low 20s. And then if you go up to the far north of the Great Barrier Reef, you can get temperatures in the mid 30s. We're trying to produce baby corals that have the traits of their parents from the warmer reefs. So the idea is to produce a kind of super coral, which might sound far-fetched. But in fact, this kind of thing has been done before. Many of the concepts that we're using in assisted gene flow come from traditional agricultural techniques. So, for example, corn, wild corn, looks nothing like the corn that we buy in the supermarket. So through a process of selective breeding, scientists and agriculturists have been able to produce corn with specific traits. Corn that's sweet and juicy and has big kernels. We're essentially using those um, same methods, same principles, but now applying them to coral reef restoration. So, how does it all work? How do you create a super coral baby in the first place? We start with different individuals of the same coral species living in different parts of the reef. So the first thing we have to do is find coral parents that have already demonstrated that they can survive high temperature. We find those colonies in the water and then we put them in tanks and wait for them to spawn. Some coral, including many found on the Great Barrier Reef, spawn only once a year. This gives Kate and her team one shot at collecting samples for breeding. In November, generally a couple days after the full moon, they release all their eggs and sperm, which we then capture we mix them all together and we produce these coral babies with uh, different genetic backgrounds. 
we can see there's all these little dots, and those are the individual larvae. That's so cute. Yeah. So each one of these cones is a specific, has a specific mom and a specific dad. For example, right here, this is family 40, and its uh, mom was a Davies Reef mom, and the dad was from the Keppel Islands. And then we take those babies and test to see if they do have this um, increased temperature tolerance. So we've ramped the temperature up to 35.5 degrees Celsius, so that's very hot. We put originally 30 larvae into each well. Um, so what we'll be doing is just counting how many are surviving over time. At this stage, coral larvae are pretty much just fat. So when they die, they just disappear. It's very hard. <laughs> they keep losing track of them because they move a lot. Definitely need some practice. 29? 29. So what we're thinking is that the Keppel's population, because it's generally so cold, they will die the fastest. But what we're hoping is that if we combine a mother colony, for example, from Davies Reef, which is a warmer reef, with a dad from the Keppels, that the babies will actually be able to survive better because they'll take on the, the temperature tolerance of the mother colony. Eventually, some of these potential super corals will be taken out to the reef to see how well they survive. Scientists, conservationists and others are working on a variety of ways to help the reef recover. And they hope not to have to use any of them. The best case scenario is that we handle climate change and allow the system to naturally recover on its own. But at the same time, we need to investigate these interventions in case temperatures continue to rise. Coral has existed on this planet for tens of millions of years. So there is hope, hope that the Great Barrier Reef will get some Great Barrier Relief. There's still many parts of the reef that are still very healthy and are still producing coral babies that can then go and reseed other parts of the reef. We're very hopeful that the reef can recover, but we need to act now so that the reef doesn't continue to decline in the future. <laughs>